Good morning. I'm Technical Sergeant Gardner, United States Air Force. I am an RPA sensor operator here at the 6th Attack Squadron. Um, operationally, my job is to operate this side of the GCS. So this is where the sensor operator sits. Our pilot will sit over here. He's kind of hidden by all these computers back here. So what I'm going to be primarily doing is operating my cameras, backing up the pilot, running checklists, making sure we're operating the aircraft safely and appropriately, and doing our best to get the mission done for the uh, supported unit or whoever we happen to be working for that day. Some simple stuff you can see, we've got all of our controls. You can kind of see it from there. That's how we're going to operate those cameras and lasers and other systems we've got. For um, our pilots, they have a similar job, but they're going to be primarily focused on their pilot side, so it's a little bit different. They're going to be learning how to fly the plane. We're learning how to just manipulate the camera and get the best imagery possible. So we've got our HUD, or heads up display right here for the sensor. This is where you're going to see your imagery and what you're looking at with the camera, or the MTS is what we call it. We've got our peripheral screens on the side, which will have things like our taxit, where we're using to look at where our aircraft is, where our airspace is, additional tech data, and then some chat rooms open to talk with our uh, counterparts, our other RPAs, and other crews we need to talk to. Up top here, we have our tracker display. This is where we're gonna see our aircraft um, from its data displayed. So in case all these go down, we still got this. And that'll give us our overall uh, map, our, again, our airspace. If we want to plot targets or situational awareness items, we can plot it there. Um, pilot, pretty similar structure. Differences, they're going to have a bunch of green stuff up here, and that's how they're going to learn to fly their aircraft, is all off those green indications. Normal aircraft, you're looking out the window, you can see the horizon, you can see left, right, above you, kind of below you. Um, for RPA pilots, it's going to be a little bit trickier because we don't have that luxury, so we have to learn to fly the aircraft a different way, and that's how they're going to do it. Otherwise, everything else is still going to be matched. We'll have some system data up here. And then down here on these lower displays is a whole bunch of numbers. And instead of gauges and everything else a normal aircraft will have, we're looking at numbers, waiting to see if things go red, yellow, what the parameters are. Um, if anything pops up, if there's something wrong with the aircraft, it'll give us a warning and tell us something is wrong with it so we can hopefully catch it in time and get it home safely without causing an incident. We got foot pedals down below, that's what the pilot will use for their yaw to make the aircraft kind of yaw left or right. And then we've got our clear comm boxes over on the side. And what that allows us to do is we can plug into those with our headsets and we can talk to our crew internal to the, this GCS. We can talk to other crews and other GCSs. Um, sometimes you can even network it to where you're talking to guys in another office out in another building or even GCSs across the country so we can communicate with other RPAs that way as well. Uh, to become a sensor operator, I will say there are some key traits. You've got to be able to adapt to your situation. Um, you got to be able to think on your feet and make decisive decisions with the information you have. Uh, being able to multitask, again, we've got all these screens and when you get to operational units, there's even more screens with even more systems and you're talking to people on the ground, whether that be command and control or your ATC or air traffic control. Um, you're talking to your supported units, your intelligence coordinators, um, your local intel. Uh, so there, there's a multitude of information coming in all the time, so multitasking is important. And then uh, for the sensor side, I would also say it takes skill with being able to manipulate the camera. So one common thing that gets a lot of people is for those of you who play video games or Call of Duty, you probably know what inverted or non-inverted is. This stick is inverted, so when you push it down, your camera slews down. When you pull it back, it's going to slew up. So depending on how people look at it, that can be a challenge to overcome. But really just uh, on top of all that, getting that muscle memory down and being able to manipulate the MTS can definitely take time. And sometimes by the time we leave here, they've got all the skills they need, but you're still refining it once you get to your operational unit. After about a year, you're usually pretty good. So my name is Lieutenant Shaq Rulo. Uh, I work at the 6th Attack Squadron as an instructor pilot. Uh, my daily duties involve teaching all of our new students how to operate the MQ-9, which you see behind me. So a little bit about the MQ-9, uh, we have 
From nose to tail, we're about 35 feet long. From wingtip to wingtip, about 66 feet long. So about the size of an A-10. Now, while we lack the impressive gun that an A-10 carries, what we have underneath the aircraft is our targeting pod. So you heard from my uh, friend, Sergeant Gardner, a little bit ago, where he talked about his duties as a sensor operator. Well, that is the name of the game when it comes to the NQ-9, right? So I, as a pilot, my primary role is to get the aircraft where it needs to be. That way he can use, utilize the camera on the bottom side of the aircraft to exploit our targets, find the bad guys, and make sure the good guys can come home safely, right? So as we're running around, as we're searching, we have about 16 hours of flight time so we can stay airborne for a long time. What we also carry on the other side of the aircraft is the capability to carry up to four 500 pound bombs and or two bombs and then four Hellfires. So the Hellfire missile, originally designed to take out tanks, uh, has been adapted to work on air aircraft so that we can take out anyone trying to ambush our friendlies on the ground. So one of the most enjoyable parts about being an MQ-9 pilot is ensuring the safety of the people on the ground, right? We're such a versatile asset. We can work in any environment. We can work in any mission set from simple intelligence and surveillance gathering to something as complex as dynamic targeting. So being able to be flexible for our ground commanders uh, and ensure that all of our friends, like my cousin who's a prior Marine, get back from their deployment safely. That's a huge, huge piece of my job satisfaction. The MQ-9, uh, we can carry a pretty diverse mix, right? So I alluded to earlier, we talked about the four GB-12s we can carry. Those are 500-pound laser-guided bombs, all right? We also have the capability of carrying JDAMs, or Joint Direct Attack Munitions. So those are GPS-guided. We just drop it from the airplane, it does whatever it needs to do, and we can continue maneuvering for possible reattacks or, you know, taking care of whatever other enemies are out there. So that gives us a little bit of an all-weather capability. So even if we can't see what's on the ground, my sensor can't use his targeting pod to find targets, we can still get some mensurated coordinates from people much smarter than me, and then we can plug those coordinates into the bomb, and then they can still find their target, right? So that's what we have from the 500-pound class uh, set of a bomb, if you will. On these rails you see that are next to me, right now we carry a two-pack, right? So we carry the M310 rail, and we can carry any of a multitude of variants of Hellfire missiles. So they weigh about anywhere from 108 to 114 pounds, right? Uh, and we have anything from building penetration capabilities to tank penetration capabilities to anti-personnel capabilities, uh, and they're a very flexible weapon. So even though my aircraft is pointing this way right now, I can still see someone off the left wing and still shoot a missile that's capable to reach out and touch that target. The MQ-9, uh, as advertised, is capable of getting up to 50,000 feet. Uh, I have never been there. I can say the highest that I've ever been in this thing, fully loaded, has been in the upper 20, so about 29, 30,000 feet. Um, however common, there are multiple configurations. There are many things they can do to get higher if they need to with this aircraft. Uh, I already said we can stay airborne for 16 hours. Um, going into some of those additional configurations, I've been airborne in one of these for up to 22 hours. So we do have some long legs, right? And then as far as speed, while we're the size of an A-10, we don't go quite as fast as an A-10, right? So somewhere between 100 knots, uh, 100 to 120 knots indicated, also about 115 to 150 miles per hour is where we usually live uh, while we're on target, but we can definitely speed up and we can uh, get a little bit more speed under our wings and get about 300 miles an hour if we absolutely have to get somewhere and the winds are helping us.